The board can have meetings at regular fixed dates. It can also have a meeting whenever it's necessary. But it's common practice for companies to hold board meetings at regular fixed dates. A director can call a meeting by giving reasonable notice individually to every other director. In the context of regular fixed meetings, if the dates are set by the constitution or the directors, then it's not necessary to give notice of each meeting. The amount of notice should be fair and reasonable or follow the rules set out in the constitution. What is fair is decided case by case depending on the company. It may vary between companies. For example, if a director is residing in Sydney and you call a meeting in Melbourne by giving him or her only three hours notice, then that is not fair. It may take more than three hours to travel from Sydney to Melbourne. A meeting notice must contain a clear and full summary of the business to be dealt with. Or else, the meeting proceeding are void. The summary is to enable the recipients of the notice to decide whether they should attend. If the notice of a board meeting is required but has not been given, then the meeting is irregular. However, such irregularity does not prejudice the outsiders who are dealing with the company. The outsiders can presume the meeting has complied with the relevant rules. Because it's impossible for the outsiders to know whether a notice has been given according to the constitution or not. To have a valid meeting, there must be a minimum number of directors present at the meeting. This is called a quorum. The quorum is decided by replaceable rules or the constitution. The quorum is two directors that is, the minimum number is two directors, unless the directors have decided on another number. A quorum must be present at all times during the meeting. For a director of a public company, if he or she has a material personal interest in the matter to be discussed, then that director is prohibited from being present and voting at the meeting. That is, he or she cannot attend or vote at the meeting. This director is not counted for the purpose of the quorum. Minutes are very important. The minute book is very important evidence of the proceedings and resolution of the meeting. The minute book must record the proceedings and resolutions of a board meeting, including the meetings of any subcommittees. Even for circulating resolutions, after they are passed, they must also be recorded. In other words, even for circulating resolutions passed without a meeting, they must also be recorded. The minute book must be signed by the chair within a reasonable time after the meeting. For shareholders, attending general meetings is optional, not mandatory. However, directors have a duty to be present at board and committee meetings and to participate in decision-making. This is part of their duties and responsibilities. For public companies, the annual director's report will record their attendance, and such record is supplied to shareholders. 
So this is a reminder to the shareholders, to the directors, that directors, you are accountable to the shareholders. They are appointed to, on behalf of the shareholders to govern the company. Companies often delegate various board functions to the committees of directors. Such delegation must be recorded in the minute book. By doing so, the board can give full attention to more important matters. The board can also distribute the workload fairly and effectively to different directors who have different expertise. It can also fulfill the potential of independent directors. The independent directors can make independent judgments on many important matters. The power exercised by the committees has the same effect as exercised by the board. The most common committees are an audit committee, remuneration committee, nomination committee, and risk committee. In some companies, there may be other committees. For example, BHP Billiton has a sustainability committee because it's in the resources sector and sustainability is very important. A proprietary company should have at least one director and at least one director must reside in Australia. A public company should have at least three directors and at least two must ordinarily reside in Australia. When the number of validly appointed directors is below the number stipulated by law, the resolution passed are invalid. But the court can validate such irregularities. You are allowed to be a director of one or more companies, but this is constrained or limited by your time, energy, and contract with the companies. You also need to avoid any conflict of interest, etc. At the same time, you can concurrently serve as a director and secretary of a company. When a company is registered, the application for registration should include the details of people who have consented to be directors. Once they are appointed, ASIC must be notified within 28 days. Any subsequent director must be appointed by shareholders' resolution at a general meeting. For, for a public company, if a director is appointed by a general meeting, each director must be individually appointed by separate resolution. If appointing more than one director with a single resolution, the general meeting must first have an unanimous uh, agreement agree with such appointments. Appointments that breach such requirements are void. Kaijo vacancy are positions that arise for reasons other than by retirement at the end of a term of appointment. For instance, a casual vacancy would occur if a director resigns, dies, or becomes seriously ill and is not able to continue to be a director. There are two scenarios for appointment of directors for a casual vacancy. For a proprietary company, appointment by director must be confirmed by shareholders within two months. For a public company, it must be confirmed by shareholders at next AGM. A single shareholder or a single director of a proprietary company may appoint another director by recording and signing the record. The constitution of a company may require a director to hold a minimum number of shares in the company 
to qualify for his or her directorship. This is called share qualification. Share qualification of directors is encouraged. It can encourage the directors to work for the best interests of the company because the directors are also shareholders. If a director plans to resign, it's very important for him or her to follow the formalities or procedures. Otherwise, if the director's name is still on the record as a director, he or she may face legal actions or responsibilities, for example, insolvent trading. Generally, a company's constitution will deal with resignation and removal of directors, as well as procedures for filling casual vacancies. It's very useful for, to read the constitution when facing such a situation. We have now come to the section on disqualification from managing a corporation. There are several scenarios by which a director may be disqualified from managing a company. These include first, conviction of serious criminal offenses, second, becoming bankrupt, third, disqualification under an order of a foreign jurisdiction. In addition, both both the court and ASIC have the power to disqualify someone from managing a company. Please pay attention to the terms bankrupt and insolvent here. They are often confused and used interchangeably. However, they have different meanings. To be insolvent is simple. It means that if you are unable to pay your debts when, you are, when they are due, if you are unable to pay the debts when they are due, you are insolvent. Bankruptcy is the term used when a business or a person is declared bankrupt by the court because they are insolvent. However, disqualified directors can apply for leave to manage corporations or a particular company. The application can be submitted to the court if someone is disqualified by the court or to ASIC if someone is disqualified by ASIC. If a disqualified director still manages a company, he or she may be personally liable for the part of the company's liabilities. Managing a company is defined by Section 206A of the Corporations Act. I will not give a detailed introduction here. Let's have a look at the removal of directors. According to the constitution of a company, a director can be appointed for life for, for an indefinite term or for a specific period. The regulations for removing directors are different between a proprietary company and a public company. A proprietary company is regulated by constitution or replaceable rules. It can also be governed by shareholders' agreements. Only if the constitution or replaceable rules gives the shareholders the right to remove a director can the director be removed by shareholders. The constitution may also allow the director to be removed by a majority of other directors. This is in the context of a proprietary company only. For public companies, directors can only be removed by the resolution of shareholders at a general meeting, no matter what other agreement they may have. 
Once the resolution of the general meeting is passed, the position of director becomes vacant. However, for a director representing a particular class of shareholders or debenture holders, the resolution does not take effect until a successor is appointed. In public companies, a majority of directors cannot remove a director. But in proprietary companies, a majority of directors can remove a director. There are some procedural requirements for removing a director. First, the notice of putting a resolution to remove the director should be given to the company and the director concerned at least two months before the meeting. The director is entitled to send a written statement to the company or speak at the meeting to defend himself or herself. If the statement is more than 1,000 words long or defamatory, the company doesn't have to circulate it to the members 